Today is an excellent occasion to sit in meditation while at the same time listening to the Dhamma. To sit in meditation, sit in the cross-legged position with the right leg on top of the left and the right hand on top of the left hand. Keep your upper body erect and close your eyes. Cultivate the meditation word Budo, Budo, Budo with each and every in and up breath. While we are meditating, we must pay full attention to guarding our minds. We guard against any thinking that is related to the different issues concerning the outside world. Keep the mind engaged internally. We keep it here in the present. This is called having a footing in the present moment. In this way, you are able to keep up with the mind. Whether or not we start grabbing after things from the past or from the future thinking, imagining, remembering, missing things, we are not able to catch up with these things because past things are past and the past is gone. Thus, there's no point in missing them. And as for things in the future, they simply lie ahead and have not yet reached us. Pakapanankayo Dhamma, Tatha Tatha Vipassati. And in every case, phenomena in the present are clearly seen. MN 131, the Lord Buddha instructed us to keep mindfulness tethered with the mind in the present. In this way, the practitioner's mind will not be shaky and flailing around. It will be firm, stable, and not obsessed with things. In every meditation session, we should reflect on our highest teacher, the fully enlightened Buddha who achieved the unsurpassed complete knowledge of awakening. What precisely did he do to accomplish this? Well, he was sitting cross-legged in meditation under the Bodhi tree. But furthermore, on that day, he sat with what we call the utmost determination. Completely alone with nobody for company and nothing to protect him from the elements, he sat there at the root of a tree as his shelter, without any seat or mat, fully determined. This is unlike us here today, we have various mats and cushions. But our Buddha only used a bunch of dry grass, which had been offered by a passing Indian peasant. That peasant was just returning from having harvested eight handfuls of grass thatch when he saw the Buddha inspecting the Bodhi tree as a potential dwelling place. He understood that this might be an ascetic searching for a place to sit and perform his spiritual exercises. And so it came that he offered the Buddha his eight bundles of grass, which the Buddha accepted. The Buddha took the grass and spread it on the ground for a seat. That's what I call giving up everything, having nothing left except eight handfuls of grass. As he sat down in meditation, in full lotus position, he focused on his breathing, taking up his breath as a preliminary meditation object. At that time, the meditation word Budo, as we have for our support today, didn't even exist yet. He solely focused on his inhalations and exhalations. His mindfulness was recollecting this is the in-breath. This is the out-breath. He didn't let his mindfulness get muddled. He established his mind upon the breath and kept it right there, absolutely steady and resolute. Through the power of truth, the Buddha established the determination, if I don't attain to the unexcelled full liberation here on this spot, I'm willing to die sitting right here. I will not get up from this seated position, come what may, even if my blood and flesh dry up, and just skin and bones remain. According to legend, he battled Mara, the tempter, with his thousand arms wielding all sorts of different weapons, accompanied by an army of soldiers representing the Kalesa Maras, the demons of defilements, and the Sakra Maras, the defilements of bodily pains. Mara fought the Buddha on his meditation seat. But the Buddha single-mindedly held his focus firmly on the in and out breathing. His mind was steady and robust, with perfect determination, unshaken, with each and every in-breath and out-breath. The Buddha established his mindful awareness right there at the knowing, this is the in-breath, and, this is the out-breath. All we meditators must not forget this word, Anapanasati Kamana. This Atapanasati Kamana is a meditation subject which many great disciples of the Buddha used in their own Dhamma practice to realize the path, fruits, and Nibbana for themselves. Therefore, we too can use the in and out breathing in our practice. For helping us to stay attentive and focused, we can mentally recite the meditation word Buddha in conjunction with the breath, bud with every in-breath and do with every out-breath. In this way, we control the mind, not letting it stray outwards into thoughts, moods and preoccupations connected with the outside world. That which knows, feels, and is aware of the in-breathing and the out-breathing is nothing other than the mind itself. The air element doesn't know anything at all. It is just a natural element, like the earth dash, water dash, and fire element. They join together and form our bodies. 
Hence the air element doesn't feel anything, it is just an element of nature. The knower, furu, the seer, the thinker, the rememberer, the holder, the attacher, the one who's letting go, the one who is putting it down, all are synonyms for the mind. The mind itself is the knowing awareness. This mind has four manifestations, feelings, delighting in sensations, perceptions, recognizing the familiar, sakras, thought formations, consciousness, experiencing the senses. These are all coming together relying on the rupa khanda, i.e. the body, which is surrounded by skin. And that which is called the mind, the heart, the knowing, the awareness is relying on this very body. We have been holding on to it since the day of our conception, when we first took up this body in our mother's womb. As soon as consciousness was available to grab hold, we began clinging to it and haven't stopped until this day. Within us, in this very physical body, the mind dwells still. Therefore, hurry up to gather your strength in establishing the mind in stability. As long as there is still an in-and-out breath, be firm and resolute in staying with the breath. Through observing the breath you will reach the mind, and when you've reached the mind, observe the mind going into the breath. The breath is only the wind element. It comes in and goes out through the power of the lungs which draw the air in. In this very body of ours, the lungs are constantly working. Whether we are aware of it or not, they still keep working continuously all the same. But the moment the lungs are going to stop, on that day, in that month, in that year, we will be dead. In an instant, nothing will be left. But because our lungs are still working right now, they are able to draw in air, which we call breathing. And we put the mind exactly here, feeling and knowing the in-breathing, feeling and knowing the out-breathing. This old mind of ours is aware and knows, now the breath is coming in and now the breath is going out. It's the duty of the wind element to go in and out. The duty of the earth element is to stay put. The duty of the water element is to permeate the whole body. The fire element is the warmth, the heat which manifests in the body. And when these four elements come together, they appear to us as the physical body. The practitioners incline and gather their minds in the very knowing of the in and out breath, until they are able to observe the mind itself. This is an important point. You must reach this point in the mind, this knowing, which is awareness itself. The wind element here functions only as a pathway, providing a method of having an object to focus our attention on, to gather the mind to make it still and peaceful. The sole purpose is to reach that very mind, the very place of being aware. But if practitioners still cannot grasp this point, they have to keep focusing on the in and out breaths, or on the feeling of every in and out breath. In other words, the mind, consciousness, or this knowing capacity comes to be aware of feeling the in-breath and the out-breath. When the mind experiences the feeling of the in-breathing and out-breathing together with the meditation word buddho, bud with every in-breath and do with every out-breath, then we will experience the letting go of all outside preoccupations and sense impressions which are, without exception, external affairs. Establish this practice and make your mind solid and stable. That's what it means to recollect the perfectly awakened Buddha as a means to inspire and spur you on. The Buddha and the noble disciples of all times who have awakened and broken through to the path, its fruits and nibbana, achieved this through hard work. Right up until the present day, all the noble ones have brought the necessary work of dana, sila, bhavana to perfection. They practiced focusing on the breath, focusing intently until they were able to observe the mind. The moment they knew where this mind is to be found, they diligently concentrated right there until it was still and peaceful. This they achieved through developing the qualities of mindfulness, sati, the power of keeping something in mind, with concentration, samadhi, the stability of mind, and with wisdom, panna, the all-around knowing of all formations. With this attainment, there was no further wavering and doubting because their minds were now awake, fully alert and present. When practicing, really do it in earnest. The mind is not far away. It's right here in ourselves, in this very body. And the mind is all we need. We don't need to buy things or to get anything else from other people. Everybody has this mind already. But we haven't been able to observe this mind of ours yet. We haven't been able to gather it, to collect it. Mostly, the mind lashes out and latches on to all sorts of things to take in. For example, we humans have eyes, and these eyes want to see forms. It doesn't matter what these forms are, people, animals or inanimate objects, forms in the sky. 
If we are not closing our eyes to meditate, the sense of sight wants to look, wants to see, anything really. This means that if we are not occupied with the meditation theme internally, we are going to get interested with externals. Observe and reflect on this outward going stream and turn it back inside by asking yourself, when I perceive forms, who is the one who's looking? If there were no mind, no knowing quality inside this body and mind, how would I ever be able to perceive and see? The dead have no way of seeing. Or what about when we are sleeping? What are we aware of? There's nothing to perceive. When the eye sees forms, it's this very mind which perceives and sees. When the ears hear sounds, the mind is perceiving. Smells, stinky or pleasant, pass the nostrils and still this very mind is the one who knows and perceives. Regarding delighting in or being repelled by tastes touching the tongue, only this mind is experiencing and knowing the taste of foods. The taste of food is a big issue. The kilesas in our human hearts are, for the most part, struggling agitated for food. It doesn't matter whether human or animal, we all subsist on food. If we don't take in food anymore to nourish our physical bodies, that's called death. The beings who are still alive, are alive because they still have some food in their stomach. The moment we start to lack life-supporting nourishment, for example like someone whose guts and stomach cannot hold their food due to diseases like cholera which cause food and nourishment to be ejected from their bodies, we are prone to die. When you sit in meditation like we are doing right now, don't let your mind slip away chasing after something to eat. We could even say that the days we get the least amount of food on our daily morning alms round are actually the best of days. We get less. We eat less. And thus, we have more time to meditate. When we eat too much or speak too much, the mind is not in good shape. The guts are crammed, the stomach is crammed and the mind has no strength for putting forth effort in overcoming the defilements and is less willing to contemplate death for sure. When we focus on Buddha with every in and out breath and are still getting distracted and forgetful, not really concentrating on our meditation work, then that distraction is taking us further and further away from the Buddha, from the Sangha, from the noble disciples, from the path, the fruits, and Nibbana. But once we've really established a firm intention in the mind to keep Buddha with every in and out breath, we have to make sure the knowing is with each and every in and out breath, feeling, sensing, experiencing the breath right in the mind, in the present moment at all times. Then, whatever outside issues there might be, they won't affect us. They will be cut off and put down completely. Keep being aware of Buddha with every breath. Follow it continuously. Keep it always in sight until that mental stream of Buddha thoughts gets so strong that it cannot be obliterated by whatever may come in through the sense doors of sight, hearing, smelling, etc. When we are not interested in any other issue except for the Dhamma, this means that our mind has gathered and gained strength and stability. Practice this until it reaches its most firm and steady condition. At that stage, nothing is able to make it waver, shake or be fearful anymore. Even if death would approach at that moment, the mind would not be phased by it in the least. The earth element is dying, never mind. The water element is dying, never mind. The wind element is dying, never mind. A mind practicing with every in and out breath is not dying at all, rather, it gains more aliveness the more we practice Buddha in the heart, while standing, walking, sitting and lying down. Whoever practices Buddha internally in this manner, firm and steady, wherever that person goes, he or she will possess the virtues of a noble one in their heart. Whether that person is a child, teenager, adult or more advanced in age, they all will be the same Buddha. The moment Buddha is really established in the heart, when it's solid and unwavering, that heart will be calm and at peace, cool and at ease. All agitation and disturbance will be gone. An experience of calmness and coolness will arise. The solidity and stability of a mind immersed in samadhi will penetrate deep into the mind until there is no more room for depression, despair or weakness. Fear of death completely vanishes. The practitioner's mind doesn't fear death because it sees that nothing actually dies. In reality, the water dash, fire dash, earth dash, and wind elements are disintegrating separately, while the mind of a practitioner stays solid and stable, unwavering, unfazed by death. Whether you are afraid of it or not, death will happen nonetheless. There is nothing you can do about it. There's no way around or out of it. If your time to die has come, there's nowhere to flee. 
When that time, that moment, that occasion arrives, you diligently have to focus and look with clear awareness and wisdom, that is, with the mind's eye. Get the mind collected and peaceful. Keep on observing the mind at all times. Day or night, it doesn't matter. Whatever month or whatever year it is doesn't matter. Whether you are ordained or are a layperson, old or young, monk or novice. All comes down to whether or not you have mindfulness and wisdom in charge. Basically, it all depends on your own level of determination. It just depends exactly on that point. It doesn't depend on the day or night, month or year. These are all suppositions. And it doesn't depend on such things like what social standing your family has, whether you are upper class or lower class, your reputation etc. It all depends on the earnestness and determination of your own heart. Whoever has firm determination and unwavering stability can take up the fight against the army of Kandamaras and Sakramaras. But someone with a fickle, faint, depressed, weak and anxious mind creates, exactly through these attributes, the causes and conditions for making the mind not peaceful, not still and calm, not gathered in oneness. The Buddha teaches us to focus on and contemplate the characteristic of impermanence. Anicca means something is not constant. And this anicca applies both to ourselves here and to everyone else. Nothing is really constant, certain, or lasting at all. We have to observe this diligently with every in and out breath. Make it firm and steady. Gather everything into this one principle. This is the principle of practice, the principle of awareness. Just be aware, don't grasp. Just keep up the sphere of awareness. Keep being aware, experiencing. Whatever it wants to go after, never mind. Let everything else go, don't follow anything. The moment some part of your mind moves, the sphere of awareness is still there. If the mind goes or comes, feels disturbed or at ease, if the body is disturbed or relaxed, it will be experienced right here in this sphere of awareness. In Buddhist practice, to be able to reach this very sphere of awareness, we have to gather the mind to make it still and calm. Make the mind cool and at ease with Budo, Budo. That Budo is here in this very heart. This Budo, awareness itself, is here right now, but it is diluted, fooled into chasing forms, beautiful and ugly. The nice ones it wants to get, and the ugly ones it despises. The mind doesn't want or desire to see a body with leprosy, someone with deformed or cut off limbs. Therefore, watch your own mind. Be aware of it at all times. Whatever forms it wants to acquire, ask yourself, once I get this, what am I actually going to do with it? Focus and contemplate to know and see with clarity that all material forms and mental phenomena, body and mind, people, animals, material objects, all have arisen and will cease. Arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. Focus on that and keep it in mind. But still, even if your own body is still going, you can observe this principle in other people or animals. Just have a look at your food each day, how many animals in there have ceased and died. All these animals were born and died in order to become nourishment for our bodies. There's no end to that. Therefore, we should practice with diligence. Gather the mind, turn the attention inwards to the heart, and find this very awareness itself. Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo, well expounded is the exalted one's Dhamma. Sandihiko, to be seen here and now. Every practitioner, every disciple of the Buddha has to practice for themselves, to see for themselves. Practice for yourself until you gain understanding in your own heart. No matter how much another person could help you, you still wouldn't get it, because the Dhammavanaya of the Lord Buddha is Sandihiko, to be seen for oneself. If one hasn't yet seen for oneself, one is still hesitant, full of doubt and has not yet arrived at certainty. But if you understand for yourself, see for yourself, Wherever the mind is at that moment, it will gather right there on that spot. The teachings of the Buddha are ekaliko, timeless. The Dhamma is not dependent on times. You don't have to choose between times or count the days, nights, months, or years like is common in the conventional world. All I ask you to do is really practice with full commitment and integrity. Let's do it. You will be able to break through to the path and its fruits all the same. You don't need to choose special times or occasions. Whenever you do it, whenever you practice rightly, then and there you can attain it.
Ahipasico, the Dhamma invites everyone to come and see for themselves. Come. You must have a look and see. To see exactly what? To see the four great elements, the five aggregates, all the sense bases and their respective fields. To see the principles of anicca, impermanence, dukkha, liability to suffering, and anatta, not self throughout the entire body and the entire mind. Open Aiko, the Dhamma leads one inwards to teach one's own mind. Whether we see a newborn baby, an old person, a sick person, or one in pain or already dead, we reflect on these sights and bring them inwards to come to the understanding that we too will be exactly like that. No matter if sitting, lying down, standing or walking, in all postures, all creatures are liable to these conditions. Thus, whatever we see we bring it inwards for reflection to educate and remind our minds. Pakata Vedatabo Vinyahiti, to be seen by the wise who are practicing rightly for themselves. Keep the mind collected. Keep it in stillness. Keep this very mind settled inwards at all times. Then you rightly deserve the title of a savaka, a true disciple of the Lord Buddha. As for the noble disciples of the Buddha, they weren't confused and distracted through letting their minds get involved outside, because they weren't attached to faces, to eyes, to birth or clan, to self, to me or mine like all the common people with kalesas do. They let it go, gave it up, threw it out until only a mind brilliantly radiant and pure remained. Pakatam, they saw it exclusively in their own mind and heart. Therefore, I ask you to remember these words well. Bring them inside and incline your mind towards the practice. And with this, you will ultimately attain happiness and prosperity. Let me finish here for today. Eva